Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Ranch Church. We're excited that you're here. Excited to join together with you in preaching God's Word and taking the next steps in our life in Christ together. I am here very early in the morning on the ranch. We've had a lot of industrial work going on here. It's a ranch. It's actually a real working ranch. And so coming, coming into view, you might see my dog, Lily the dog, uh, my lab dog, a couple horses. But we're also just trying to, trying to get in front of a bunch of heavy equipment that might be coming around us. And so uh, we're here really early and it's cold. It's cold on the ranch right now. So uh, we'll be bundled up maybe as we get into the winter season here. But we're excited to come to you right now, preach God's word, encourage you greatly, have a great message from you from Romans chapter eight, one of the most wonderful chapters in all the Bible. And I know that you're gonna just take it all in. And so let's pray have some worship together, and I'll come back to you with God's word. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray now that you would come into our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Say amen. Of course, it's amen. Let's worship. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people travel did you hear the singers roar when the lost began to sing of jesus christ the saving one and we can see that god you moving mighty river through the nations Young and old return to Jesus. Fling wide you heavenly gate. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. Here we go. darkness tremble when all the saints join in one song and all the streams flow as one river to wash away our broken days here we see and here we see that God you moving the time of jubilee is coming we're young and old, return to Jesus. Fling wide, you heavenly gate. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. Open up the doors and let the music play. Songs that bring your 
going to open up the door. Open up. Open up the doors and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing. So
Open your Bibles, my friends, to Romans chapter 8. Just continue on in this great chapter, speaking about God's blessings, about how we're free of condemnation. And so I thought about what to title this. You know, I was just really trying to pray about that. And the part one of this, this will not be part two, so I guess I already gave it up, is called Stoked for You, part one. And it sounds a little cheesy if you ask me, or a little funny, but this is Stoked for You, part two. And I just couldn't think of a better way to continue on our series, but simply to name it part two in the series. And I am stoked for you. And you should be stoked for what God has promised your life. Because he needs and wants to remove condemnation from your life. And the reason for that is so that you could go and be a blessing because he wants to bring his blessing in and through your life. That's what you're actually designed for. And it is not going to happen any other way. That's the nature of salvation. Part of the wonderful fruits of salvation is that salvation brings to the Christian, to the believer, the absolute, permanent, complete, and total removal of shame and guilt. And that happens with our identification of the cross through identifying with Jesus' cross, his death, 
and his resurrection, as is taught in the previous chapters of the book of Romans, we experience a tremendous liberty. It's supernatural. It's powerful and it's palatable. And so you have not been designed to carry around condemnation. In fact, let me just pause for a second and share a few thoughts with you that the truth of the matter is, is that our community, our culture, our nation, this world, it carries condemnation. And things that are good get twisted quickly into things that are bad because of condemnation. And so think about families as they get together for the holiday. Many families have people, sometimes every single one of them, carrying burdens of condemnation. And so they're just putting this shame and guilt exchange on one another over the holidays. They want to love one another. They want to enjoy one another. And yet they're, they're sort of boxing in a sense with one another as they're putting shame and guilt on one another because they have it. And it's a supernatural removal. It's not something that you look in the mirror. It's not about self-effort. It's a supernatural process that takes care of that through the cross. We see that in companies. We see that in our nation. We definitely see it in social media. Think about social media. Some of the foundations, the basic foundation of social media was not necessarily that bad. This was a, you know, if it's Facebook, hey, we want to have a We want to have some friends and we want to show nice pictures of one another. Show me your children. Show me your holidays. Oh, that's great. How lovely that you guys went on a vacation, that you went here. Oh, we're celebrating anniversaries. Oh, I'm cheering you on. Really nice comments about that. Now, (laughs) now we have evolved. We have an academic term now. It's called cancel culture. And so that's an example of how condemnation just takes over everything and just tears it down. And it is not about self-effort. And so now let me read to you from the scriptures here about this in Romans chapter 8. I'll start at the very top of the hour here, which in verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I love that. That is beautiful. Underline it in your Bible. For God has done what the law... Now, I want you to take that. God has done. See, it's been done on the cross. God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we will be talking about the Spirit in depth. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. That's exactly what you want, that life and peace. And you're going to see a connection between the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and your mind. There is a connection there that's very important to actually understand. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, great news, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, The Spirit is life because of righteousness. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. Here's the real principle. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. Catch that text. Dwells in you, then He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. There there is that important connection. And so I'm going to give you a, two references in particular, and you're actually going to see them on the screen. I want you to take these in. Now, in the first teaching that I gave on this one, I mentioned Genesis chapter 12, and I went through it in depth. And so you can go back to the first part of this and enjoy that teaching in depth. But I will give it to you now just by reference very, very quickly. But in Genesis chapter 12, we have what's called the Abrahamic Covenant. And this is where God comes to Abraham, having done nothing. He's, he's, um, 
He's going to be a man who's going to spend the rest of his life growing and experiencing transformation just like us. We think our patriarchs are perfect. They are not. They actually have some significant deficiencies, and Abraham would have a few, and God would give him grace and favor, and that's the point. He has done nothing to earn this, nothing. But God has come to him supernaturally, simply out of love, as he comes to you, and he grants to you this grace and favor. And so the Abraham covenant goes like this, Abraham, I am going to so love you that I'm going to bless you because I want to bring my blessing back into the human race. And by bringing my blessing back into the human race, I will bless those that you bless and I will curse those who you curse, but my blessing will come through you. It will be according to that locality, land, seed, and blessing, but it will be a covenant throughout the entire world and for all time, a covenant that Jesus Christ himself would fulfill as the promised Messiah. And so that is Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to go to Psalm 86 because I want you to uh, see that with me. So Psalm 86 is a great description of what we're talking about right here in Romans chapter 8. And if you look at my Bible, which is right here, you're just going to see a personal note. Now, I'm not going to let you zoom in. <laughs> so the personal note says, it has a symbol of the heart. It says 86, and it says, save my life, and I dated it. In other words, for myself, there are moments where I'm, I'm just so needy before God that the Word of God becomes so living and active, it saves my life. It saves my life again, a born again again kind of experience. And so Psalm 86 is one of those, and here is that verse. In verse 8 it says, <clears throat> Scripture says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come. Now look, at I'm hoping that you're watching this, and you know maybe we even put this on the screen, just this one sentence for you so that you have it so clearly, because I want you to repeat it with me. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you. It's a declaration. It's a declaration. This is going to happen. The, the purpose of removing shame and guilt from your life, the very purpose of that is so that the human race is activated under the covenant of God's blessing to go out and actually be a blessing so that all the nations come to God to worship Him. Now, that's not even the end of the story there, because all the nations you have made shall come and worship you, O Lord, and shall, what's it say there in the text? Shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. And so these verses are connected. Uh, we started with Romans chapter 8. That finds its connections in Genesis 12, which again I referenced last week in an in-depth teaching uh, related to the subject matter. And now I'm just camping in a single psalm, Psalm 86, to help you to understand that God must remove shame and guilt from your life. He must remove it from the human race. It's a personal application. So it's obvious that not everybody has this. Few have this. That's the problem. You have to have this. That's hopefully taking place. But you have to have this, the removal of shame and guilt because it is actually God's will and His design so that the, His blessing, His covenant blessing, which started through Abraham and now is fulfilled in what we call the new covenant, which Jesus fulfilled night before he died in a Passover ceremony which he fulfilled completely on the cross by the blood of Christ which he fulfilled through the resurrection which we fulfilled through the coming power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and so now we can operate in this new covenant with shame and guilt removed and our lives experience the most powerful and dynamic change and so that leads us now to the words which you saw in the text, the repetitive refrain was the Spirit. So the word the Spirit, which is the mentioning of the Holy Spirit, is a repetitive refrain in this chapter because these are supernatural things 
that will take place. And so I'm going to give you some spirit words uh, to help you understand the depth of this. So, uh, and again, I'm going to ask that this be put on the screen over here just as an example. So the first spirit word is ruach, R-U-A-C-H in a transliteration from the Hebrew. And that finds its way in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, the very first verse of the Bible, some of the oldest words ever, ever written down in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then the next verse is a mention of the spirit hovering above the waters. And that spirit word is ruach. And that creative element of the spirit, I want you to follow this, that creative element of the spirit, which created the universe, which set the boundaries, the laws of physics, which created mountains and oceans and streams, that same spirit is operating in you as a believer. That is that promise. And that is why so many of us who have uh, enjoyed it and experienced it, the only way it can be described is that we actually have a new life. Jesus most well known to many believers would speak of this as being born again. But this Ruach spirit, that very same spirit which created the heavenlies, is that same spirit now in that new covenant blessing operating inside you, which is the whole purpose of how that blessing is going to go out. So it's not of our self-effort. We have to have that Ruach spirit coming to us and then that Ruach spirit going out from us. So that is the first word I want to reference from the Old Testament, this word Ruach. The second one will simply be, in English, the word face. And the two references to that is also Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. This is the word face, but it's actually the idea of being like personal and intimate and so recently I've done a few weddings, which is always fun to do, and they've been some great stories. Big shout out to the Urso family, if you guys are listening to that, sure had great time with you guys. And so I've done a few weddings, so here's, here's what happens, you guys are familiar with this. So it's the husband and the wife, the man and the woman, and I make them face each other. So I want them to face each other, and they're gonna hold each other's hands, and I'm gonna, they're gonna look in each other's eyes. And, and sometimes they're so excited and a little nervous and they, you know, it's the classic I do vows. And so sometimes they're looking at me and I tease them and I make them look at each other. And then uh, I, I kind of invade their space physically and socially to get them to be more intimate. And so that's the idea of being face to face. Now, years ago, I was doing a wedding for a gorgeous, gorgeous 20 something couple. And what they wanted though, in a very interesting way, is just their parents and the, the, the best man and the maid of honor, that's it. So this wedding party was about eight or nine people. She had a gorgeous dress, a lovely young gal. And so she wanted to be in the Pacific Ocean. I'm just above Santa Barbara. And so she wanted to be in Santa Barbara uh, with, you know, with the water to her knees. And he's in his really nice tux. I had a very nice suit on. This thing's getting wet up my backside and front side and everything. And so that's the experience they want. And Pastor, will you do this for you? Sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it happen. So it worked. We're all in the Pacific Ocean in our tuxes and our suits. Her in her wedding dress flowing. The pictures are outstanding. But all they wanted, they didn't want me to preach. And they just wanted that vow and they just wanted it to be done and they wanted the photo op. These were lovely people. Uh, they're married to this day and doing fantastic. And so, okay, sure, I'll do it. I'll serve you that way. We'll do the shortest wedding ever. Do you love her? Do you love him? In Jesus' name, amen, okay. So now we're together to catch this. This is the idea of face, right? Because the Spirit of God was over the face of the waters, but it's this word in Hebrew related to presence. And so, and so there we are in the presence, they're in the presence of one another. They love each other. He's looking at her. She's looking at him. They're gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's this intimate, beautiful presence. Mom and dad were all like in a holy huddle in the Pacific Ocean and we're getting wet. And so the, the, they both turn to me and they say, Pastor, could you, could you go longer? Do you have more vows? And 
and both of them were actually medical students. And so they started to cry. It's just so beautiful. I don't want this moment to ever, to ever leave. Of course you don't. I, I always want to look at her this way. I always want to look at him that way. I just want to stay here. I don't, I don't want the world to harm her or harm us. I don't, I don't want the problems that, that go with, you know, they, they, they were just so in love with that presence and that moment and the beauty of it, the blessing of it. And so they didn't want to leave it. That's what it means to phase. And so I've quoted for you Genesis chapter 1, verse 12, but the second one plays out in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, because the scripture says that Adam and Eve, when they sinned, left the face, the presence of God. So can you catch that connection? They're, 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 they're dismissed from the presence of God. They, they had a relationship with God, as I just described, with that couple together, and now that's gone. And that's actually what's being described as a believer's relationship with God. And it comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. So these, these are spirit words. That's, that's why I'm talking about how is this condemnation going to leave you? How is this guilt and shame going to leave you? It's going to leave you by the cross. And the teaching from Romans is that that same spirit which came in to Jesus and resurrected it from the dead, that Ruach spirit, that, that face intimacy is actually what's operating inside us so that we then will be that conduit, we'll experience that blessing, and we'll go out with it. The next word that I'm going to give you is breathed. So you'll see this on the screen as well, and I'll give you the same reference here of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the word breathed as it relates to the Spirit is that Adam himself was, was taken from the ground and then God breathed into him God's divine life, and he became a living being. And those are fascinating words in the text in the original Hebrew as they relate to something not being alive and God breathing upon it, and it therefore coming, coming to life. And so in Romans chapter 8 now, the word is pneuma, which is the fulfillment of all of that. We have this pneuma, this breath, and so at Pentecost, there was this breath that came into believers as a fulfillment from Jesus being raised from the dead. And these believers had everything that I just described to you then and, of course, even now. And then lastly, by way of reference, John chapter 20, verse 21 there was Jesus at the very end. I actually love this verse. I mean, I really love this. This is wild. This is Jesus coming into a room suddenly, and he's going to actually breathe on them. Speaking about those first followers of Jesus after the cross and resurrection, and they're going to, they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. So these are the things that are true. Lastly, in, in the text, I want to point this out to you. Let me read to you from verse 12 on, because you're going to see the last spirit word here. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's what the text says. But if by the spirit, there it is again, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God, for you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So Abba, Father is the next spirit word that I have for you. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children that heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Some comments and let's run for home, friends. I hope, I hope you're able to internalize this. I hope you're able to, to follow. I pray that with all of my heart because this, this, is, this is that blessing. It's what you're designed for. But people are foolish. They, they think they can just walk around planet Earth as that blessing. You have to be in full possession of it. And there is a dramatic, true, categorical, directional compass changing truth in your life reality when it has come to you and so two things with that one 
the text spoke about an heir. And heirs are different. So there was a movie recently, I'm not going to tell you the title. There was a movie recently that had a family that was serving a wealthy family in the nature of the movie. And that family that was serving the wealthy family had a chance to sort of have a few days in the wealthy family's home. And they just began to thrash the home. Uh, they began to think it was theirs and make all kinds of rude comments. And they just were taking things out of the cabinets and out of the kitchen. And they just made a colossal, colossal mess, pretending that everything was theirs. The truth is, if it was theirs, if they were the heirs of all of that, and the true heirs of that, as the storyline sort of illustrated, would never, would never treat their stuff that way. An heir would understand this is my father's house and I'll take good care of it. I'll clean it, I'll keep it orderly, I'll uh, maintain it, I'll make it better, I'll improve upon it. Because my father's house, I'm an heir. I'm not sloppy with the things that I've inherited. And so there's a very difference between being a son and daughter of God and those who are outside the kingdom of God, those of us who are sons and daughters of God, we understand the privilege, the honor. We also walk in a true inheritance. And those things mark our lives. So I've been preaching for a while and I haven't had much like practical things to give to you. And so let me go in there now with you briefly and give you two. So by way of practicum right here that you'll see, I have two things for you. The first one is in order to apply these things in your life, just very directly, build an altar and God will light the fire. So God, God wants you to build a, a, an altar. And you might think that an altar was something that, you know, was designed very well. In fact, in the days of the Old Testament in particular, and really somewhat even in Jesus' day, when we had these devotional altars, uh, these were just simple structures. So actually behind the camera, as you guys are looking at me, is actually a river, and there's large river rocks there, and we could take these rocks out of the river, and we could place them and kind of make these little, you know, memorials to them. In fact, if you go on the river with me, if we go for a hike there, or if we go down by the Pacific Ocean, which is right nearby, there are some memorial rocks of people who have lost their lives or maybe got married, and you'll find these memorial kind of altar set up there, but they're just simple rocks set up on one another, sometimes with some simple marking. That's what we're talking about. And so you would build an altar and let God light the fire. Second application related to this is that you build an altar out of broken things. So I would think I'd get a carpenter, like I mentioned beforehand, and I'd make this nice tabletop, and it would be nice, and it would be, you know, finished well, and the corners would be great. No, not, not in this principle. You, you build an altar out of your loss. You build an altar out of your sin. You build an altar out of your errors and your brokenness and your pain and your sufferings. You build an altar out of those things. And you put them together because God's the only one who can light the fire from them. And, and you give them to God. You, you, you make that altar. You put them together. And it does not seem like an offering. Like to me, it would not seem like an offering. I'm like, really, God, that's what you want me to offer you? I, I kind of thought you wanted me to offer you my best. <laughs> I want you to offer me your worst, Rick. I, I want you to place an altar of all the terrible things in your life, all the sinful things, the disgusting things, the filthy, trashy things, the broken things, the lost things, the things which have hurt you so deeply and broken you so profoundly, all of those things are those rocks. Put them all together and then lay on top of it and I will light a fire on that, a divine and sacred fire. Watch what I do. That's what God is saying. That's what the scripture's teaching. And so, my friends, there has to be a start. And part of that start is to pray. And so I'm going to pray right now and ask that Jesus Christ come into your life. I'm going to ask for you to take this message so very, very seriously, to not click away, to not blow it off, 
Do not think the context is not anything but divine, sacred, holy, and real. I'm going to ask for you to let Jesus Christ light that fire inside you. I'm going to ask Jesus Christ to be central in your life, focus of your life, because you have taken the broken things of your life and built that altar and let the Holy Spirit come and light that fire and let the breath of God come and do its work. And so I'm going to pray right now. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I pray, God, for every single person, Lord God, listening to this, and I pray that they would invite you into, to be their Savior and Lord. Speak to them now, Lord God, for your servants want to listen. So repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sin, and I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Take control of my life and change me and make me everything you want me to be. Come now, Holy Spirit, and light a fire on the altar of my life that now belongs to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, it's a simple act, but it's a real one if you mean it. It's a life transformational one. And so you can be confident that God is on the mood and move, and now it's time for discipleship for you. And to help you with discipleship, I want to ask you to go to ranchchurch.com and there's a contact page. Let me know exactly who you are. And I will send you some materials in the mail for free that will get you going in terms of discipleship. And also invite you on a journey with us as we're all in that journey of transforming discipleship. So go to ranchchurch.com. There's a contact button right there and let me know. If you also be a giver, uh, you can go to, you can actually click on this uh, uh, video right now and like it and uh, subscribe to the channel. It's all, all very helpful for this YouTube. Lastly, go to ranchchurch.com slash give and be a giver. We just make no apologies about giving uh, to Lord Jesus Christ, being those who give tithes and offerings this time of year, the holiday season. Many people give special gifts. If you would remember the Ranch Church at this time, if you do so, that would be wonderful. We welcome that greatly and thank you. But go to ranchchurch.com slash give. It's on our website right there. And join us in this way of tithes and offering. Everything that we have here uh, goes to our day-to-day -day operations for our church and also for our local and global missions. Thank you so much for your love, your kindness. We love you so very much. We believe that God is on the move and by his sovereign grace is going to allow us to reach 10 people, 10 million people in 10 years. Love you so much. Go in Jesus' name. Amen.